All right, guys, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. I'm Josh Dyson, at Classical School of Wichita, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, I'm Director of Operations. Uh, this is my fourth year to be there. Uh, one of the things uh, made, I wanted to do was give a little shout out to, to my friend Dan Snyder here. So, as in the process of invention and, and working through these talks, Dan has a, an awesome website called the Classical Commonplace, classicalcommonplace.com. So if you go to the website right here beneath my screen right now, can I do that? <laughs> <laughs> then you go to the link. It's right here. We'll, we'll put the link there. Working on it? All right, we'll get that later. Classicalcommonplace.com is an amazing site. All the, Anything you need for rhetoric and then beyond. It's unbelievable what he's put together. Um, there, I know when I search five common topics, it's one of the first three you know, on Google that comes up. So this is this is Dan right here. Check out his website; it's an uh, incredible piece. You ever heard of this idea of imagining your audience naked? <laughs> <laughs> this is something that I've heard for a while. Have you heard of this mm -hmm. this concept? Um, I've never done this, and I'm not doing it now. <laughs> so I just want to put you at ease with that. And I don't actually really know what the point of it is. Uh, it actually seems really distracting if you're trying to talk and that going on. But it, it seems to me that at the very least, they always say that you imagine your audience naked, but is, shouldn't that also be recipro reciprocated? Does that mean that the audience would imagine the speaker naked? That's a little too close for comfort, right? Not everybody feels uncomfortable. It's interesting in this idea that we look at of nakedness, right, it was actually a really common idea in the classical world. Right, it's, it's said, and this, this seems to be a disputed idea of exactly if this really happened or not, but in the Greek city-states, whenever a, a person would want to be a candidate for a position or a role, that they would appear naked before, um, before the others, before they were voted in. Uh, and the idea, of course, being that they were exposing who they are. There's nothing to hide. Um, it's all right there. Right? If you've ever gone to battle for Sparta or for Athens, and you've taken uh, an arrow or you've been stabbed, it'll all be proven right by your body. You bear the marks on your body. Of course, the Greeks are famous for the idea of their, uh, the Olympics being done in the nude. Gymnastics, uh, wrestling happened in the nude. Plato and the Republic um, advocated that uh, the gymnastics should be co-ed and also should be done uh, naked. Right? There's this obsession in the Greek world with nakedness. Uh, I, th I think we have maybe a similar idea that sometimes you'll hear people talk about um, open kimono. You ever heard that when somebody says, you know, we go open kimono? And the idea of it seems to be that you're opening yourself up and being vulnerable or you're being raw or authentic uh, with other people. And while we see this idea throughout um, the gymnastic and the, the physical activities in the Greek world, it's really in the dialectic that we see the importance of nakedness. The goal of the dialectic is really to get to the point where we are exposed to one another, right? that we show up with who we actually are and all of our, our wounds and flaws and whatever it may be. This is essential as we look at what true friendship can be. Are we willing to go uh, to that place. In the 12th century, Bernard de Clairvaux wrote a short book called On Loving God. And it's an incredible book on the celebration of God's love. He has what he calls the nobler gifts. Uh, what are they nobler than? They're nobler than the chief gifts. Chief gifts. The chief gifts are bread, sun, and air, which are the bare necessities of life. The nobler gifts are din dignity, knowledge, and virtue. So I have those there on your notes. Dignity, knowledge, and virtue. He has a little bit different understanding, maybe, than how we would define these words. 
So here are his operational definitions, and this is how I want it to function. It can be a little bit confusing, especially made with virtue that um, is understood differently in the classical world. But dignity refers to the free will and domination over animals. So people have the, the gift of dignity. The gift of knowledge refers to recognition of that, of that dignity and seeing that it is not from ourselves. So the true source of the dignity is God our maker. And then virtue refers to seeking after the maker and adhering to him. As we look into the purposes of friendship in the classical world, I'll present these three gifts as a rubric for understanding the kinds of friendship. As we consider friendship, uh, according to Aristotle, Plato, and Augustine, uh, we'll take this rubric and we're going to see that dignity, you're going to relate to Aristotle's understanding of friendship, knowledge, going to relate to Plato's understanding of friendship, and Augustine um, will be to virtue and his understanding of friendship. Have you ever noticed that in the church we don't talk about friendship very much? So, I did a, a Google search to try to find, you know, where, what are the places that we see friendship talked about? And one of, the, one of the areas that probably comes closest to friendship is things like small groups, right, or cell groups that are done in church. So, I went to a website, it's called communicatejesus.com. Uh, I don't know anything about the site, but they have a little link there, 16 names for church midweek groups, right? <laughs> Ironically, there are 17 listed. I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> Here they are. Number one, groups, city groups, life groups, small groups, redemption communities, home groups, cell groups, fusion groups, life change groups, family groups, connect groups, community groups, growth groups, Bible study groups, pastorates, missional communities, and fight clubs. <laughs> Those are your options if you want to go to church and be part of a small group. Right? Probably a lot of us are part of groups that go by those names. But what's interesting is what's missing from that list. None have anything to do with friendship. Why is friendship on hard times in the church? We like all these other names. But friendship, there's something about friendship that um, we might have a little bit of an issue with. Perhaps it's been watered down too much by things like social media. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. But anyways, when we look at friendship, Aristotle is kind of the place we go to to uh, come up with the basic three understandings of friendship. This the, maybe the ones you're familiar with. The three kinds of friendship, according to Aristotle, are friendship of utility, friendship of pleasure, and friendship of goodness. Utility is essentially a business relationship. So I give you something, you give me something back. A pleasure is what we think of maybe as our high school and college relationships. You know, we go party together and have a good time, uh, but as soon as that time of life's over, we forget any of those people ever existed. But then, of course, friendship based on goodness is a true sharpening of each other, um, of true growth. Here's what Aristotle says of the first two kind of utility and pleasure. He says, so when people love each other on the ground of utility, their affection is motivated by their own good, and when they love on the ground of pleasure, it is motivated by their own pleasures. That is, they love the other person not for what he is, but for what is useful or pleasant. Consequently, such friendships are easily dissolved if the parties do not continue to show the same kind of qualities. Because if they cease to be pleasing or useful, the friendship comes to an end. This becomes part of our self-examination, right? As we look at our, our friends... You know, are they, is this what our friendships primarily are? Is it a give and take thing? I give you this, you give me this back. Is it just I love, I love being around that person because they make me laugh or I feel good when I'm around them? I get pleasure? Or is there something deeper to those? Look at the third kind of friendship, the friendship based on goodness. A common idea you see in the ancient world is to think of a close friend as a second self. And I have on your sheet there, the bottom half, uh, these quotes here. The first, Aristotle says, The good man feels toward his friend as he feels toward himself, because his friend is a second self 
to him. Interesting passage in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 13, verse 6, it says, If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son or daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your friend who is as your soul. It's an interesting way of putting that, as your soul. Jonathan and David is probably the most famous of friendships in the Old Testament. It says, As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. What does our culture say about this relationship? It has to be homosexual. Right? They cannot conceive of two men having a friendship on this level. That's not romantic. I would dare say that in the church, if we read this and didn't know it was in the scripture, we might feel the same way. Right? We know that's the wrong answer, though. It makes us a little uncomfortable, some of this language. Augustine, upon the death of his friend, says, I was even more surprised that when he was dead, I was still alive, for he was my other self. Someone as well said of his friend, he was half my soul. I had felt that my soul and his soul were one soul and two bodies, and my life was to me a horror. I did not wish to live with only half myself, and perhaps the reason why I so feared death was that then the whole of my much-loved friend would have died. And these, these are amazing uh, comments that they're making about their, their friends, right? Uh, this, this unity of being. So you look at you know what marks this third kind of friendship is that above all else this friendship is based on goodness. So as Aristotle says, the only, only the friendship of those who are good and similar in their goodness is perfect, and of those who desire the good of their friends for their friend's sake, that are most truly friends, because each loves the other for what he is and not for any incidental quality. And he continues a few pages later, this is the Nicomachean Ethics. It is persons of low character that are friends on the grounds of pleasure or utility, this being the similarity between them, while the good are friends for each other's sake, because their bond is goodness. These latter, so those of pleasure or utility, are friends in the unqualified sense. The others are friends only incidentally. As, as believers, as Christ followers, we recognize that these kind of friendships are important, but are we developing these, these, this depth of friendship? And then we can think in our schools, right? Are students developing these depths of friendship? So how are deep friendships developed? Very simple for Aristotle. He says, in addition, friendships need time and intimacy. For as the saying goes, you cannot get to know each other until you've eaten the, prover the proverbial quantity of salt together. Yeah. Anybody know how much the proverbial quantity of salt is? Allegedly, it's about 14 gallons. <laughs> so, uh, I actually love salt, so that's why my friendships develop more quickly. <laughs> Pretty simple. Time and intimacy. Uh, you, you just can't get away those things. 14 pounds of salt, right, that we've, we've taken in together. That means, that means a lot of eating together. Right, a lot of time together. Another important caveat that Aristotle is that these friendships must be limited in number. He says, probably then it is, it is as well to aim at having not as many friends as possible, but only as many as are enough to form an intimate circle. He continues, but it is not possible to have many friends whom we love for their own sake and for their goodness. We must be content to find a few of this, this quality. Right, so we can't expect ourselves 
our students to have these kind of relationships with everyone in their class. Right? That's not, that's not what we're talking about. That's not what our expectation is. Um, 16 kids together are not going to have this depth of relationship. It's unrealistic to expect that. This is something to think about in the church also. If our small groups are 12, 15, 20 people, is it really getting to that, that level of friendship, right? It still has to get, it still has to break down further uh, to smaller groups. What hinders these relationships? Aristotle says, besides, one has to get to know a man thoroughly and become intimate with him, which is extremely difficult. I think this is something that we all know. It is not easy to develop these friendships. I think the chief offender for us is busyness. The other day at church, uh, we're doing that whole, you know, shake somebody's hand during the middle of the worship service uh, thing, um, which I'd like to do away with if you're watching this. <laughs> so I heard two guys uh, near me, and one of them says to the other, um, hey, when are we get our families together? And the other responds, life is so busy. Said, That's just life. He said, I can't do anything about that. And that was a sad thing for me to hear, that he thought that he was a victim, that he was, an in, yeah, he was this innocent bystander that could do nothing about how busy his life had become uh, with all his kids' activities and all the things he was involved in, etc. Because the reality is we can do something about it. It saddens me to see that many of us, even in the classical education movement, use this excuse just as much as anyone. We have bought into the American lie that we don't have time. Even though somehow we find plenty of time to stay up to date with This Is Us, or our social media accounts, or Trump's latest faux pas. As Americans, unlike the ancients, we view friendship as optional. It's nice to have when you can. It's an add-on. The ancients, though, viewed it as essential and necessary for the virtuous life. If that's what our end goal is, as classical education, educators, virtue, we should take that very seriously. Augustine says, in this world two things are essential, life and friendship. So both should be highly prized, we must not undervalue them. Life and friendship are nature's gifts. God created us that we might exist and live. This is life. But if we are not to remain solitary, there must be friendship. The other thing, of course, that uh, hinders our friendships is fear and shame. All right, how do we see fear hinder relationships? We hide ourselves. How do we see shame hinder relationships? We cover ourselves. Of course, this comes from Genesis 3, or the fall in the Garden of Eden. As a result of their sin, they experienced fear and shame for the first time. And they hide from God. And they try and cover themselves with their fig leaves. So it becomes very interesting to consider that the Greeks sought to get back to a state of nakedness. To return back to a state without shame. Imagine you're Socratic discussions in class, your heartness discussions, if there is no fear or shame. No one is embarrassed to ask a question. No one's embarrassed to take a risk. We all know what the enemies of these conversations are mockery, the snickers and laughter, the sneers, the whispers, the looks. Now, these are things that we probably all sat in, around these circles and seen and wished 
there was more we could do about them, right? As we watch one kid shut down because of something that's happening in the conversation. Or sometimes you know something's happening and you just can't figure out what it is. But for whatever reason, the kids are not showing up. What are you doing in your classroom to eliminate the inappropriate manifestations of these in your classroom? So as we move on now and to look at why is friendship so important for our students in our classical schools, we return back to Bernard, where we had that sheet to refer to. Dignity, of course, refers to free will and the domina uh, domination over animals. Knowledge refers to recognition of that dig dignity and seeing that it's not from ourselves. And virtue refers to the seeking after the maker and adhering to him. So the first one here is we consider Aristotle primarily in the friendship of dignity, the first noble gift. Aristotle writes, Consequently, the friendship of worthless people has a bad effect because they take part, unstable as they are, in worthless pursuits and actually become bad through each other's influence. But friendship of the good is good and increases in goodness because of their association. They seem even to become better men by exercising their friendship and improving each other for the traits they admire in each other get transferred to themselves. All right, this is... This is why we're doing this group thing, right? Hoping that there's an iron sharpening iron effect. Hopefully the good is making the other better. Friendship separates us from the animals. Aristotle is famous for saying that man is by nature a social being or a political animal. It seems that even animals can have the first two kinds of friendship based on utility and pleasure, but only those with the dignity of the Imago Dei can experience a friendship based on goodness. Of course, friendship not based on goodness can have the opposite effect. That's no secret. Famous passage from the Confessions, Augustine. He said, Why then did I derive pleasure from an act I would not have done on my own. Remember this part from the Confessions, right with the pears? Alone I would not have done it, could not conceivably have done it by myself. See before you, my God, the living memory of my soul. Alone I would not have committed that crime in which my pleasure lay not in what I was stealing but in the act of theft. But had I been alone, it would have given me absolutely no pleasure, nor would I have committed it. Friendship can be a dangerous enemy, a seduction of the mind, lying beyond the reach of investigation. Out of a game and a jest came an avid desire to do injury and appetite to inflict loss on someone else without any motive on my part of personal gain and no pleasure in settling a score. As soon as the words are spoken, let us go and do it. One is ashamed not to be shameless. If you worked with 7th and 8th grade boys, especially, one is ashamed not to be shameless. You know, the scripture warns us about such things and such associations and friendships. Paul says, do not associate fruitless work of, with, a, with the fruitless work of darkness. He also says, do not be wrongly matched with unbelievers. To move on to the second type of friendship, a friendship based on knowledge. So if you follow there, we've gone from dignity, looking now into knowledge. You associate him, prim this is primarily with Plato and Socrates and the dialectic. So for knowledge, again, it's the recognition that the dignity we're just talking about is not from ourselves that has been given to us from something else. So we see this as the purpose of the dialectic is to peel back layers to get back to the origin of things. Things as they are. 
For Plato and Socrates, this meant getting back to the forms, right? to see above the line, if you remember the famous line analogy from the Republic. We're talking about nakedness a few times, right? Here's where we see this. This ability to be open to receive and to give without fear and shame. And this is probably best seen in the symposium, Plato's symposium. Who's read the symposium? Excellent. So I, I don't want to recommend the book. <laughs> it's amazing in its own way. It's also highly disturbing. Um, so yeah, be careful if you go that, that way. There are some disturbing elements that the, the thing's about. What they're doing is they are praising Eros, right? which of course is the erotic love um, that we think of. Um, but the point that's going to be end up being made right, is that these other men have this, this view of Eros, which is very maybe perverted is one way of looking at it. Um, and Socrates is going to show that Eros actually leads us to something much higher and much greater uh, to the good itself. It's difficult to identify a particular passage from the symposium, um, but in Alan Bloom's translation, he has an essay afterward called The Ladder of Love. So I'm going to actually quote Bloom um, to help us understand Socrates in the symposium. So imagine they're having this dialogue Okay, there's I think six or seven of them here um, at this um, gathering, this party, discussing Eros. Bloom says, among the participants, there's an atmosphere of perfect equality and a kind of democratic trust in one another. Their speech is both frank and exquisite. There is no aristocratic formalism and, and no democratic vulgarity. They speak openly about Eros, both taking it seriously and laughing about it. They know one another well and can ridicule one another delicately without offense. They are clearly having fun without any opposition between edifying talk and enjoying oneself. There is nothing of the atmosphere where somebody clinks on his glass at the table and says, let's talk about serious things. This is an utterly civilized entertainment of men who can drink and make love, but who also can both rhyme and reason. There are no constraints of tradition or moralism. It is an association of friends, the substance of whose relations is speech. It would be very difficult to find another historical situation so favorable to this playful but philosophic friendship. And that's the great, the great value of reading a symposium. And, and if you can take it, take it on that level... See, these men were friends, adamantly, dare say violently, disagreed with one another, especially because one of them is Aristophanes, who in some ways Socrates would credit with being the reason he gets killed. Um, <laughs> but their candidness that they have with one another and ability to speak freely is an amazing thing. Of course, the word symposium literally means drink together. All right, so of course this wasn't the craziest party. The craziest party was the night before in the symposium. So Socrates waits for the next not so crazy party to come to. Um, but Bloom makes an interesting comment about the consumption of alcohol at the gathering. He says the evolution of the word symposium from this Greek association with his drunken revelers telling one another what they care about most to the symposiums of sober, of sober modern scholars with their scientific detachment is most instructive. Right, we see such radical differences between these men who are having a great time being together, talking about these deep things while making jokes at the same time, to now what we consider the serious conversations are very stoic, Right, and everybody is very scientific in how they present things and everything has to follow a certain format. We've come a long ways. What, I think part of the concern in the classical movement that I have is which of those are we going for? 
there does seem to be an element a lot of times where classical education seems to be synonymous with this very uptight kind of everything's put together thing, right? I'm not saying that's the way things are, but that can be an association that people have. Or are we encouraging them to be part of conversations with friends where they can open up and be themselves? So it's interesting as Socrates, though Socrates was drinking, Alcibiades says, no human being has ever seen Socrates drunk. So all these men, yet Socrates, while he is still participating, he maintains his sober state of mind. Despite our views on alcohol, I think it is worth considering what is holding us back from opening ourselves up. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> you edit this, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Despite what our views are, and I'm sure there's differing views in this room, I think it's worth considering what's holding us from opening ourselves up. What's holding us back? If we will not consume the eau de vie, we should all heed the counsel of the Song of Songs, to be drunk on love, and to, and to consume the true water of life, the gospel that frees us to show up without fear and shame. Is, is that the effect that our education, our gospel-centered education, is having on kids, where they are free, are, are being more free, right, to be themselves, or are they actually hiding more, so that others don't find out what's really happening? Lastly, the friendship of virtue. Oh, no, Augustine, what time does this end? 12 o'clock. 12? Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you. Remember, virtue is that which is, which is relationship with God himself. This is why Aristotle and Plato can't be in this, in this realm. Right? They can get to a certain place, but they can't actually take us to Christ. Right? This reminds us of Dante's Inferno. Um, you know, Virgil's only able to get uh, Dante to a certain, certain place. He can't take him all the way. So look at it. Friendship pointing, um, our friendship is pointing to friendship with God. As Augustine is reflecting on this friend dying again, he says, You took the man from this life when our friendship had scarcely completed a year. It had been sweet to me beyond all the sweetness of life that I had experienced. My eyes looked everywhere for him, and he was not there. I hated everything because they did not have him, nor could they now tell me, look, he is on the way, as he used to be the case, as used to be the case when he was alive and absent from me. The very dear friend I had lost was a better and more real person than a manichae phantom in which I would have been telling my telling my soul to trust. Only tears were sweet to me, and in my soul's delights, weeping had replaced my friend. What's happening for Augustine is the death of his friend ends up showing him the, the lack of his belief in this Manichaeism, um, this heresy. Right? He knows that there is something that's pointing him to God. So he'll say of this later, entrust to the truth whatever has come to you from entrust to the truth whatever has come to you from the truth, you will lose nothing. The decayed parts of you will receive a new flowering, and of all your sickness will be healed. So he's seeing that through these lacks lack of friendship now, because he's lost, they're actually pointing him to a place, pointing him to Christ, where true the truest friendship can be had. Right? And, this, this, and this is coming actually from friends who are not believers um, in this context. To speak of what we were saying a, a, a minute ago, one of the, the thrusts of the symposium is going to be that Socrates cannot achieve this. He says in the symposium, the mortal nature seeks as far as possible to be forever and immortal. But as far as he knows, he can't get there. 
right? But he knows that there's something that keeps on pointing him to what's beyond, to something greater, to something above. The highest form of friendship among people is friendship in God. Augustine said, they love their friends truly who love God in them. They love, their trends, they love their friends truly who love God in them, either because God is already in them or in order that God might be in them. And later again he says, Love has drawn you here, but love of what? If of me, it is, it, this too is good, for I desire to be loved by you, but not for myself. Since therefore I love you in Christ, do you in return re- love me in Christ and let our love for each other sigh and groan to God? Right, let our love for each other sigh and groan to God. Of course, Christ shows us what true dignified friendship looks like. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this. If someone laid down his life for his friends, you are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, nor the servant does not, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. So we see the importance of these relationships, the importance of friendship in our Christian life if these are essential to virtue, if these are essential to knowing God, how are these showing up in our classrooms, in the culture of our schools? I think in our schools, in the same way we treat as the church has, where it's a nice thing to have, it's great if they have, some, they have friends here, maybe they'll help with our marketing, maybe they'll help people stay here, they won't go over to that other school across the town, whatever. Um, but we, I don't know if we've really grasped that friendship is at the heart of education. This is at the heart of virtue formation. So a few practical things to consider before we finish here of the how. First is to model it. No student is greater than his master. Have we modeled a culture of friendship? This is, this is the thing that I love about my school more than anything. Hands down, number one thing is the culture of the faculty. There's truly a, a, a friendship culture. We love to be together right, most of the time, except we're in a car together for five hours and then we're ready to get out. And, well, we have fun. We, we enjoy going places together. We enjoy going to conferences together. We enjoy, you know, at, the, at, the, at lunch, the faculty comes and they all sit together and they carry on the conversations that have been happening in, uh, in classrooms or the things they've been reading. Right? I, I think that our students see that our, our teachers actually enjoy friendship. Right? And, it's, and it really is, I think, at the heart of of what we've done in a school and any success that we've had is based on the faculty's love for God and love for each other, which then transfers into love for students. Right? There's, the students can see. Right? It's, it's caught more than it's taught. Right? They're seeing these men and women put this into practice. So let's celebrate friendships. Let's put this into practice in our own life. Let's counteract the culture of busyness. Listen to yourself over the next couple, next couple of weeks. Do you hear yourself making the same kind of comments? I don't have time for this. And if so, why? What, what is it that you do have time for that's taking place of time with people? Another thing is for us to look at ways to cultivate this in our classes. We're, we're in the process, a couple year process now, of trying to get a house system up and going. It's not easy. It's not. 
Um, but I think these are directions of things we can, we can do to try to create structures that put kids in, in contact, right? Of having fun together, doing games together, uh, having team events they're doing together. We don't do it uh, perfectly at all. We have a long way to go. Um, but that's, we're trying to commit to this thing for this purpose. Some of our, our classes that have the best cohesion have class parties that they throw themselves. Like, there's, there's one class in particular I can think of that like, they organize themselves to do a class party and they bring all the food and, and snacks and stuff. Are you encouraging that? Are you saying, hey, that's awesome. Yeah, go, make, go do the initiative. I know it's hard because sometimes they don't do the best job of making sure all these things are taken care of and their cleanup process isn't the best and they forget to get the spoons and the, and the plates and so they come to the teacher resource room to get those things, um, which is not allowed at our school, right? <laughs> things like retreats, I think are great things. We've started doing uh, beginning of the year retreat uh, to, do, to build some of these things. I think we could do better. I'm sure some of you guys probably do some really great stuff. Maybe you go somewhere, maybe you do overnight things. Um, one of the best things we've done is actually probably our trips. So in ninth to 12th grade, uh, we go on a trip every year. We go to the East Coast. We're going to Boston, uh, Washington, D.C., New York. Uh, so on those five-night trips, there's cohesion that's, that's built, not only among students, but with faculty and students together. Sports, of course, are an incredible outlet for this. There's the danger of sports, probably more than any of this, to take our time away. I think there has to be some kind of, we need to be careful on that. But there's a, there is something very valuable about them, uh, if we can use them uh, properly. Uh, other competitive teams, right? Whether it's robotics, debate, uh, mock trial, those kind of things to help build unity as well. Group projects. Eating together, we had the shortest lunch in probably all the schools here, so I can't say, but there's something to consider, right? How are we giving these kids a chance to eat together and enjoy together to celebrate? Then lastly, are we talking about it? When it comes up, when you're reading Aristotle, when you're reading the Nicomachean Ethics, are you, are you honing in on the opportunity you have? to do the practical application of friendship with these kids, right? As it's, you know, it's all throughout, especially classical, the ancient literature um, of, of men and women um, who are, who are friends. Or is that celebrated? When you're reading the Lord of the Rings. Are we, are we celebrating that and saying, hey, this, this should be you. Are you doing this? Right? How is this happening? I think part of this is a good reminder that are, are we wanting these kids to master the text that they're reading? Or are we truly putting them in a place to be mastered by the text? Right, are we putting them where they think that they're over the text? Or are we putting them under the text? Right, That, that these things are changing them. I think most of us agree that that's what we want. But practically, when it's coming down the classroom, is that what's happening? I think friendship is an excellent case study there. In your classroom, ban, banish embarrassing others, shaming others, mocking others. I know this is hard because there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a time whenever it's, there's a playful right, element to it that those who are good friends can do this well and it's, and it's fun. Um, but unfortunately, so many, especially in those 7th and 8th grade, ninth grade years, that it's not, they're not having fun, right? They're taking those things very personally. And they can be an enemy of what we're doing. Reward risk. When students take risk, Reward that. How, how, whatever you, you think that they're going to well, value, uh, I know that's different for everybody, um, but make it, make it something where they want to step out and take risks to ask the question or to offer an answer 
in my experience, so many times I've, I've sat with a class and there's a kid that, that hardly ever says anything. But then they gather up the courage to say something. And it's like, wow, that's, that was brilliant. Like, and, and I don't think you even know how brilliant what you said is. But of course, everybody thinks, oh, that was the dumbest. Like the, all the class is like, oh, no, that's why so-and-so never talks. It's like, no, you, you, have, you have something there that's worth sharing. Um, how do we reward that? And that's, that's not an easy thing. That's, that's the tough part of uh, what we're doing in the classroom. Invite them to share thoughts that are not fully developed. And that's part of, the, part of the dialectic is we've been talking on our, on our, on our ride up here, a lot of the conversation was the difference between wanting to be right and seeking the truth. And students want to be right more often than anything. So they want to make sure that the answer they give is going to be the right answer. When probably it would be better if they would go ahead and put out something that gives the opportunity to talk about it. That also means that we have, to, we have to lead by example there. Cool, thank you for your time, guys. Any questions before we...